Uh, very exciting if you're visiting with us today. We have been uh, engaged in an exciting study in the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, we, we always go through the book of Acts as part of our first principle studies, and so we decided this year to do it on Sunday mornings. And uh, so we've already covered chapters 1 through 15, and today we're going to cover from chapter 16 all the way through chapter 21. Um, right now, you should have the ushers passing out some maps, and the maps that you have are a record of Paul's missionary journey. The first missionary journey in the book of Acts occurs from Acts chapter 13 to 14. The second missionary journey of Paul, as recorded in the book of Acts, goes from chapter 15 to 18. And our third missionary journey that we're going to be studying out next week, uh, and a little bit of this week, is uh, Acts chapter 18 through 21. Some people will even include a fourth missionary journey of Paul, and that's when Paul goes from Jerusalem to Rome. Um, but some would say that Paul was forced to go to Rome, and even though he wanted to go there, it's not considered a missionary journey. But yet I, I, I conclude it as, as Paul's fourth missionary journey. The title of our lesson today comes from Acts chapter 17, verse 6. In the Revised Standard Version, it's turning the world upside down. Yeah. Let's go to Acts chapter 15, verse 36. This is where we uh, left off last time. And we remember that Paul and Barnabas had a very sharp disagreement about taking John Mark with them on their missionary journey because John Mark had abandoned them in the faith when they were on their first missionary journey. And so right here in verse 36, it says, Sometime later Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. You know, Paul and Barnabas weren't just about converting people and then just leaving them there. They wanted to not only make disciples, but also teach them to obey everything. And so right here, they go back to strengthen all the churches that they had already planted. You know, where do they go? Let's well, skip on down to verse 41. Thus he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And so if you get your map out right there, on the very eastern side or the right side of your, your page, you'll see kind of going at an upward angle the word Syria. Well, well, that's kind of the area that Paul is starting off right here in today's study, okay? So we're going to see as he moves through this map right here. Let's go on in chapter 16, verse 1. He came to Derby, and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted him to take, take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because the Jews who lived in that area for they knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. You know right here, as Paul is starting off his missionary journey, uh, the Bible says that he comes to Derby in Lystra and he hears about this young brother named Timothy. Now, Timothy's got such an awesome reputation, but he was kind of a, a kingdom kid. Because the Bible says his mom was a believer, a disciple, and so too was his grandmother. But it doesn't say that his dad was a disciple, so most likely he was not. You with me right here, guys? And his mom was a Jew, but his dad was a Greek, and so Timothy was never really fully Jew. And so Paul goes, if I'm going to take this guy on my missionary journey right here, I've got to help him become relatable. And so the first thing we've got to do right here, Timothy, is we've got to circumcise you. Now, now talk about a challenge of joining that mission team right there. <laughs> Amen, guys? But yet, Timothy was so fired up to join with Paul that he allows Paul to circumcise him just for him to be relatable. So then he does it, but then it's kind of interesting because it says they went to, to deliver the decisions reached by all the elders. But what decisions were reached? That the Gentiles didn't need to be circumcised. So even though Timothy allows himself to be circumcised, he didn't even need to. He, he goes and delivers these messages to all of the Gentile brothers in the faith right there. But you know what's awesome? is Timothy had a reputation in more than just one church. His reputation was talked about in several different places. How's your reputation? You know, very often I think we get excited when we have awesome people in our own fellowship, and we need to try to strive to have great reputations in the church right here. A reputation for being a servant, a reputation for being an encouragement, a reputation for being sold out. But right here, Timothy was so sold out, so awesome, so fired up, his reputation expanded beyond the confines of his own church. You know, one of the sisters I, I, I'm very proud of, 
is uh, Gabriella. And, uh, you know, Gabby, again, is going to be going to Santa Barbara in a few weeks here. But uh, it's very encouraging. Uh, one of the things she does in the church is she puts her quiet times on her website. And she's very disciplined about it. She puts, I think, one or two quiet times on the website a week. And so she has her own little blog right there. And it's funny because it says G- uh, quiet times by Gabby. And, and she does a very awesome job at it. But what's encouraging is when we went to the conference uh, in L.A. on winter, uh, the winter workshop up there, uh, she was going around and different people were going, hey, I, I know you. I, I've heard about you because I've been reading your quiet times. And so her reputation has literally gone throughout the kingdom of God as being a very spiritual woman. And it's no wonder why God is sending her on a mission team to Santa Barbara. Amen, guys? You've got to ask yourself, how far does your reputation go in the kingdom of God? I mean, are you just happy with kind of your friends that are right around you being satisfied with your effort and your faith and things like that? Or do you strive to have a great reputation in the entire kingdom of God? Well, I think uh, it is pretty awesome, and I do think we see why he had such a great reputation in that he allowed Paul to circumcise him. But we've got to ask the question, why was he so willing to entrust himself to Paul? Well, let's go back to Acts chapter 14, verse 19. You know, Timothy lived in Lystra and Derby. And this is recorded a little bit earlier in that same location or in that same area. In verse 19, it says, When some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over, they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Wow. Right here we find that in the same area that Timothy lived, Paul came and preached the word. He was persecuted and stoned, dragged outside the city, and then he has the faith to get back up and walk in the city and preach the word of God. Amen. And it's no wonder why Timothy was so quick to follow. He saw this example of Paul, and he goes, wow, I mean, this guy's awesome. I've got to get on this guy's mission team right here. You know, I, I think so often in the church, we, we try to do a really good job of counting the cost of people who become disciples. And, and that just means that we get together and we, we try to help them to understand exactly what it means to be a disciple so that when they get converted, there's no surprises. That said, oftentimes when you become a disciple, you, you really don't know what you're getting into. You know what I'm saying right here, guys? But, you know, even more important than counting the cost is living the cost for people to see. Because you can say one thing, but your life might say another. And if you don't live out the cost... You might say all the right things and help prepare people as best you can, but they're not going to know what it truly means to be sold out. You know, very exciting right here in the church is a a young man who's been studying the Bible, uh, Walker Medesi. And uh, Walker's awesome. He kind of grew up around the kingdom and things like that. And uh, recently, his parents, Jill and Vartan, uh, as, you know, they shared for communion or contribution right there, uh, they were restored back in uh, January. And uh, he is so blown away by how radical their change was. He goes, man, i got to go and study the Bible. And very excitingly, he's he's about ready to get baptized. Let's pray for him. He should be getting baptized this Wednesday night. Amen, guys? But you know what's awesome is he not only has counted the cost from the Bible's point of view, in some ways he's seen what the Bible says, but he also has looked at his parents' lifestyles and he goes, okay, I get it. Amen, guys? You see, we've got to live out the cost so that people we help become Christians can understand the cost when they become disciples. Let's read on in chapter 16, verse 5. You know what happens when they go out and start strengthening the churches and preaching the word? It says, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So right here is the first account of another church outside of the Jerusalem church growing daily in numbers. And won't it be exciting when we start growing daily in numbers right here, church? Well, you got to be sold out. Verse 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. Let's stop right there for a second. Right here, for whatever reason... Paul and his mini mission team is trying to get into Asia, but for whatever reason, they're prevented from getting into Asia. And I think in those situations, a lot of times when we're not getting where we want to go, spiritually speaking, or just in general in life, we can feel like, 
we have some sort of hard hardship on us or, or life is just being mean to us. But right here, Paul has a very spiritual perspective. And he goes, the Holy Spirit is preventing us from going into Asia. You see, Paul understands something or understood something that I think a lot of us don't understand. And that is the sovereignty of God. That God either makes things happen in our lives or he allows them to happen in our lives. Either way, God is in control of all things. And he has a purpose and a plan for us right there. And so when Paul couldn't get into Asia, he goes, okay, God's preventing me for a reason. Yeah. You know, well, what's the reason that Paul is being prevented from getting into Asia? Well, let's read on in chapter 16, verse 9. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I mean, is that awesome right there or not? As they're waiting, trying to figure out how to get into Asia, the Bible says that God gives Paul a vision. You know, what's the vision all about? Well, he sees this guy coming over from Macedonia, and, and hey, Paul, you've got to come over and help us. He goes, okay, God is telling us we need to go to Macedonia and preach the word. But why is this very significant? Well, if you look over at your map right here, you, you see that, that whole region right there of Asia, kind of in the center and a little bit to the right right there? That whole area is Asia, Pergamum, uh, Lydia, Smyrna, Ephesus, Miletus. Paul was trying to get there, but you see that purple area on the top? That's, that's where the spirit would allow him to go. Then he gets to the edge right there by Somethrace, and the Bible says at that point he has the vision to go over to Macedonia. Well, notice that there's a channel of water right there in between. This was the first time that God had called Paul to travel across water to preach the word. Amen. You see, Paul was used to just going everywhere on land. But God had a different plan for him, and he called him to go beyond where he had been before and to stretch his faith for the kingdom of God right here. Yeah, I think so often God does things to us to stretch our faith out because we're so limited. We, we only think that we can do what we've already accomplished. And so God will push us beyond where we're comfortable and test us and push us to spread his word and advance the gospel of God. You know, one of the brothers I, I, I've been so encouraged by is our, our brother Chris Ritzus. And, you know, it's funny how you can kind of be around somebody for a long period of time but still not really get to know them as well. And he shared something on Wednesday I just didn't even know about. It. And he shared that a, a few years back he had been in a car crash that was near fatal. It was a very serious car crash. And although he probably should have died, the only thing that happened to him is that he shattered his kneecap in 10 different places. It, it just fractured all over the place. It just busted up his knee. And the doctors at the time were thinking that th there might be a chance that he's going to walk, but no way will he ever run again. And uh, we understand that those things were allowed by the Holy Spirit right there. And so he didn't get down on himself, but he worked at trying to just get his, his knee back to where it needed to be. And so he tried to re rehabilitate and just do therapy and things like that. And then about six months ago, uh, Bobby and him ran his first half marathon. Isn't that awesome? From going to a place of not even being able to walk, to a place where he's running further than most of us will run. <laughs> That's pretty intense. But then he goes, why is God doing this? Well, maybe I can use this to help raise money for missions. And so he signs up for another marathon, and he creates this, this website or GoFundMe page, and he solicits donations from people for special missions in order for him to run another marathon. And already our brother Chris has raised almost $350. Is that encouraging? You know, there's an animal called an African impala. It jumps 10 feet high. That's pretty cranky. 30 feet far, but yet it, it's kept in a place with only a three-foot wall, three wall. Because an impala will not jump to where it can't see. And as long as you can block its vision, it'll stay within the kind confines of your wall that you've created for it. You know, I think so often as disciples, that's how we are. We don't see where we're jumping to, but God sees it. And he will push us beyond where we're comfortable in order for us to get where he wants us to go. Amen, guys? Amen. You know, I never forget, a long time ago, uh, one of the brothers that was leading the church in Santiago, Chile, w was sharing about the church down there. And it was Matt Sullivan, and he now leads our, our church in Orlando. And he was just sharing to the leaders of the Chile church. And he's just saying, hey, guys, uh, we, we've got to have a vision to evangelize the world. They're getting all fired up. He goes, hey, we've got to have the Crown of Thorns project, and we're going to go there, and we're going to go there, and we're going to go there. It's going to be awesome. Everybody's getting fired up. He goes, I want to ask, who's going to go to Colombia? 
And everybody raised their hand and goes, yeah, we'll go to Colombia. He goes, who's going to go to Venezuela? Everybody starts raising their hand, yes, we're going to go to Venezuela. Who's going to go to Peru? He goes, yes, we're going to go to Peru. He goes, awesome. Who's going to go to China? <laughs> and, thank you, my sister. But everyone was silent. Why? Because all our South American brothers and sisters thought that they're only limited to South America. And so, hey, we're going to evangelize the world. Yeah, but we're just going to do it in South America. And so once China came onto the plate, nobody considered going to China. Well, I think for us as American disciples, I hope that you're not just planning to go to another American city in your lifetime, but that your faith has been stretched beyond the United States, and you really do have a vision to tackle the entire world. Amen, guys? You see, guys, we've got to have an uplifting vision. But two, we've got to have side-by-side -side preaching. Let's go to Acts chapter 16, verse 11. It is encouraging right here that Paul has the vision to Macedonia, but then Luke says, we got ready at once. You see, once Paul was given the vision, it was not the other disciples who had it, but they still got in line with the guy who did. So often, we don't have the vision that God needs us to have, but we have to get behind those brothers and sisters that do have the vision of God. Amen? Yeah. Verse 11. From Troas, we put out the sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in a leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. If you get your map out right here, you can kind of see where Paul is going. The first city he tries to tackle in Macedonia, right at the center at the top right there, is Philippi. You know, there's, there's, another, there's a lot of other cities that, that the Bible mentions right here. I mean, he, he surpassed Troas. He went to Samothrace. And then he went to Neapolis. Why, why didn't plan, or Paul plan on planting a church in one of those cities? But he just kind of skipped on over them and then goes to Philippi right here. Well, Philippi at this time was a city known for its wealth, and it was a very cranking city. And so right now, I think we're starting to see the ministry strategy of Paul to tackle the biggest and best cities first and then have those cities go and reach out and tackle the other smaller cities. Yeah. Amen, guys? Yeah. Well, let's read on right here. Verse 13, on the Sabbath, we went to outside the city gate, the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth in the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Right here, they get to this amazing city in Philippi. And one of the first people they meet in Philippi is this woman named Lydia. And the Bible records right here that she was a dealer in purple cloth, which at this point was a very valuable type of cloth. I mean, the, the color purple was very hard to find. And so for someone to deal in purple clothing, this was like the Versace of their time. You find here, guys? I mean, Louis Vuitton was Lydia right there. <laughs> and so right here, Paul finds her. He reaches out to her, and she ends up becoming a disciple. And you know she's a cranking woman because she persuades Paul to come to her house. I mean, Paul's a pretty strong guy in the Bible, but yet she persuaded us. And so not only does Paul hit the main cities, but he gets the most cranking people in the city because an opinion leader in the world is an opinion leader in the kingdom of God. Amen, guys? Well, let's read on. Verse 16. Once, when we had been going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had the spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to her, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that she, th their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Now, this is pretty awesome right here. Paul and Silas are getting to the city of Philippi. And as they're going around sharing, all of a sudden this demon-possessed girl that has the ability to tell the future starts coming up behind him and just starts yelling out to everybody they're trying to reach out to. And it's kind of cool in some ways, but on the other hand, you can imagine, that'd be pretty annoying. You know, hi, my name is Paul right here. Hey, these guys are the disciples I got! Oh! 
Who is that? What is going on? And so Paul just gets ticked off, and he looks at it, and he goes, hey, I rebuke you, come out here. And the demon comes out. That was pretty, pretty awesome for the girl. But yet her slave owners got pretty ticked off because they were making a lot of money off of her ability to tell the future. And so they get Paul and, and Silas right here, and they bring them to court and go, hey, look, these guys are destroying our city. They're throwing into an uproar by teaching things that are not unlawful for us to practice. Well, let's find out what happens right here, verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. Wow. After they have been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. You know what those stocks are, those wood things with the little holes? And, and your feet are just locked in there. Well, let's read in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining and ticked off because of how terrible these people had treated them. Yeah, I might have misread that part right there. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. Why? Because there was nowhere else they could go. But what an awesome attitude and an example right here from Paul and Silas. Everything was going against them. They were being persecuted for doing nothing. In fact, they even helped this little girl out. But yet in prison, after being flogged, after being fastened in the stocks, after being guarded and persecuted and taunted, they just start rejoicing and singing out to God. And you can bet that the other prisoners were listening. Yeah, because they don't have anywhere else to go. But they're going, what is wrong with these guys? I mean, all this stuff has happened to them, and they're still happy about it. There must be something with them. Let's read on. Verse 26. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Now, at this time, if you were a soldier that guarded the prison, if your prisoner escaped, that means that not only would you be dead, but you'd be killed in a very torturous way. And so this guy right here is seeing the prison doors open and seeing everybody gone. He goes, oh, my gosh. I might as well just end it right here now. And so he gets the sword out and starts to kill himself. And it goes on right here in verse 27. Or verse 28. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, right here, he wasn't asking a spiritual question. He's going, what do I do to not get killed? But we know Paul and Silas took advantage of that question right there, didn't they? And so it goes on. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. That was his repentance right there. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Amen. You know, right here, I think one of the most amazing things in the scriptures is that the word of God was so powerful that not only were disciples, getting, people getting, becoming disciples and getting baptized, but so too was their entire families. Yeah. And what an incredible thing right here. This guy should have been killed. He should have been dead. And yet because he knows that his time is short, he goes, I've got to become a disciple. Yeah. And so at that hour of the night, at midnight, he and it, not only him, but his entire family is put into the waters of baptism because they knew that there might not be a chance that he would live the next day. Yeah. You with me here, guys? Well, let's keep reading. Starting off right here in verse 37, or th verse 35. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. So Paul and Silas, even though they converted the jailer, still went back to prison. Why? Because they didn't want their new brother to die. <laughs> and so they allowed him to put him back in prison. Verse 37, but Paul said, if officers, they beat us publicly without trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to rid of us so quick, quietly? No, let them come in themselves and escort us out. I mean, that's pretty bold right there. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where she was all by herself, lonely. Isn't that amazing? They converted this high-powered woman right here 
And with her convictions, with her faith, with her opinion leadership, she ends up converting a lot of other people. And so by the time Paul and Silas came out of prison, it was not only Lydia, but also Lydia and the brothers. And so Paul and Silas were encouraged, and then they left. <laughs> Let's keep reading. Chapter 17, verse 1. When they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went to the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I proclaim to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. There we see it again. Everywhere Paul went, he tackled the most cranking places, and then he went after the most cranking people. Verse 5. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started to ride in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Revised Standard Version, these are the men who have turned the world upside down. And Jason is welcomed into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. You know, right here is amazing. Paul converted the most awesome people. He didn't shrink back from the most cranking, most opinion leaders in society right here. I think so often as disciples, we get intimidated to share with people that we think are more cranking than we are. And sometimes it's because we think that they kind of have it all together. Because, you know, how could a CEO of a company not just have his life together? And so often in our worldly mindsets, we forget that as disciples, you have something that everybody needs. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO of some company. It doesn't matter if you've got a cranking family or a cranking job or if you're a professional athlete. You still need the word of God. And when you get the word of God, then and only then can you be saved and be planning on going to heaven right here. So let's find out what happens. Verse 10. Or excuse me, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So now Paul is all by himself in Athens. Not only is he all by himself, but the Bible says while he's all there in Athens, he's at the intellectual capital of the world, and he becomes distressed because the city was so idolatrous. And so, you know, Paul does what most of us would do, and he just waits for backup. Well, let's, let's, let's see if that's what Paul does. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. You see, Paul didn't just stop preaching the word of God right here and wait for backup. He literally went and preached anyway, day after day after day after day. Well, what happens? Well, eventually he, he runs into uh, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers and gets into quite the discussion. And you know how those philosophy types are. Then they come and invite him to speak at the Areopagus, which was kind of like a, a gathering of really smart people. You know, they got the most cranking minds in all the world, and they put them there at the intellectual capital of the world, and they had great discussions about the new philosophies and ideas of life. And this is where Paul is invited to speak to. And so we pick it up in chapter 17, verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But... Others said, we want to hear you more on the subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. Once again, we see Paul in one of the most amazing places, full with the, the greatest minds in all of Athens, the intellectual capital of the world, and he's winning over the opinion leaders. See, I could ask you, what type of people are you reaching out to? That's not to say if God puts somebody in our path, we ignore them because they're not, quote, unquote, opinion leaders. We, we will share with anybody who walks and even those that don't. That said, when it comes to building the church of God, we need to try to go for the people that can have the most influence in God's church. And so literally to try to target opinion leaders. But you got to ask, are those the type of people that you're trying to reach out to? Or are we intimidated by those people as disciples? You know, one of the things that, that happened with my wife and I is uh, we were up in L.A., uh, kind of by a Sepulveda area or El Segundo area. And uh, one of the places that we were frequently going to was Chipotle. 
And uh, so we went to the Chipotle that was out there, and uh, my wife came running out of the Chipotle. And I was just kind of parked in the car and coming inside. She comes running. She goes, she would never believe who I saw. And for my wife, her, her favorite basketball player is Blake Griffin for the Clippers. Now I have an issue with that because mine is LeBron James for Miami Heat. But I mean, there's grace in the kingdom of God. And so she comes running out of Chipotle. She goes, never believe who I saw. I go, who'd you see? She goes, I saw Blake Griffin. In fact, dude, here's a picture of Blake Griffin right here. He looks so different than when he's on TV. I go, that's awesome. Did you share your faith with him? She goes, oh, I forgot. I didn't do it. I go, no. We missed our opportunity right there. And it was a very short sight right there. It's kind of like seeing Bigfoot. He's there and he's gone. It's like that right there. So we didn't get the chance. And so we, we felt kind of down about that. Here my wife and I were like, man, I wish we could have just shared with him. Maybe he would have become a disciple. Well, a few weeks later, we were out in Hawaii, and we run across another opinion leader. And in Hawaii, everybody knows BJ Penn. He's a guy that fights in the, the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and for many years was one of the best fighters. And so in Hawaii, he's kind of like a hero for all the people because he was born and raised there. And not only is he from there, but he's also from my hometown. And so we're just going through the Honolulu Airport trying to visit the church out there. And uh, in the distance, we see BJ Penn. And my wife nudges me. She goes, hey, is that that guy BJ Penn? I go, yeah, I, I think it is. She goes, we've got to share with him. Because she remembered Blake Griffin. She goes, I'm not doing that again. So, you know, we, we kind of squeamishly go up to BJ Penn. And he, he's a fighter. So it's a little bit even more intimidating right there. But we go, okay we got to share with him. So I get up and go, hey, what's up, man? Are you, are you BJ Penn? He goes, yeah, I'm BJ Penn. I go, that's awesome. In fact, I'm from the same hometown as you. And we started talking to different people and stuff. It turns out he actually knew some of the same people that we did. I said, that's awesome. That's great. Hey, uh, we've got a question for you. <laughs> and you know when you get to that moment and, and you're trying to think of a cool way to say it? There is no such thing as a cool way to say it. So I go, you know uh you go to church? He goes, nope, don't go to church. I go, yeah. I didn't want to say it, but I, was, yeah, I kind of figured. <laughs> I go, hey, you know, BJ, we've got this awesome church right here. you, you got to check it out. It's called the Honolulu International Christian. We start going on all the details and stuff like that. He goes, oh, okay, cool. Well, well yeah, uh, maybe I'll go. I said, awesome. Can you, let's, can you give me your number? He goes, well, here's my card. <laughs> and he gives us his card right there. Now, granted, he didn't come to church. Please pray for Brother BJ. But he was evangelized. You with me here, guys? And I think for us, we've got to find those types of people. Imagine if he would have gotten converted. Imagine the type of impact he could have had. But we've got to have the heart to approach and share with opinion leaders. Side-by-side -side preaching. Thirdly, our third point comes from 2 Corinthians 4.9, where it says, Persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. In the J.B. Phillips translation, it says we may be knocked down, but we were never knocked out. That's our third point is knocked down, but not knocked out. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. You know, this is awesome right here. Paul leaves Athens and ends up finding himself in Corinth, and Corinth also was a great city. But at this point, through just looking at what Paul is doing right here, he most likely runs out of money, and so he goes back to making tents. Well, as the Lord would have it right here, he runs into another couple. And this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, have just been expelled from Rome from the emperor, and so they find themselves in Corinth as well. That's kind of awesome. Uh, in history, it's recorded by a great historian named Suetonius. At this time, it's extra biblical right here. Uh, that since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of this guy named Christus, Claudius expelled them from Rome. In other words, there was such a commotion in Rome because of Jesus, the emperor Claudius goes, I don't even know what to do with all these guys. I'm just going to send them all out of Rome. And so he gets rid of all the Jews and all the disciples together and among those people are, Cla are Priscilla and Aquila. And once you have it, what their job is is the same job as Paul, tent making. Amen. And so Paul meets this awesome couple right here, and they sort of join forces together in the ministry. Verse 5. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. So at this point, 
Most likely, Silas and Timothy brought Paul money so he could be in the full-time ministry. Verse 6. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clear out of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justice, a worshiper of God. Christmas, the synagogue ruler and his entire house will believe the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in the city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Amen. This is amazing right here. As Paul is in Corinth, you get a sense that there's kind of a little bit of hardship. He's going and he's going from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, and nobody's open to the word of God. I mean, you ever felt that way before? Well, he finally gets a few people, but you get a sense that he probably was starting to shrink back spiritually. And so the Bible says, one night the Lord spoke to him in a vision and said, hey, do not be afraid. Now, when God says, do not be afraid, that means that you're probably afraid. <laughs> and so at this point, Paul is going, oh, my gosh, I, I'm preaching, I'm doing all these things, but nobody's getting baptized. And God goes, hey, don't be afraid. You're going to be all right. In fact, I've got many people in this city. Who are you talking about, Lord? I can't find anybody. Well, God wasn't talking about who was currently in the city of, of Corinth, but those that would become brothers and sisters in Corinth based upon whether or not Paul would continue to preach the word of God. And so right here, he has the vision of perseverance bringing a great amount of fruit to the Lord right there. Well, let's find out what happens right here. Chapter 18, verse 12. While Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him to court. This man in the charge is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you, but since it involves questions about words and names in your own law, settle the matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court, but Galileo showed no concern whatsoever. I mean, right here, Paul has this awesome vision. He's going, man, God's going to be with me. A lot of people are going to become disciples. That's awesome. He goes out, he shares his faith, and what happens? A big old commotion. In fact, it was so bad that they beat the synagogue ruler, Sosthenes. Well, man, how could God work through a situation like that? Well, let's, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 1, and let's see uh, kind of what happens with Sosthenes right here. Chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. The guy who gets beaten up in the synagogue ends up becoming a disciple. And he must have been awesome because he helps Paul write the book to the Corinthian church right here. And so, once again, God delivers on his promise to Paul and he converts an opinion leader. You know, so often I think God will limit his miracles to our faith, yes. to our faith. Where there is no faith, there can be no miracles. Yeah, you know, I read a while back on Facebook, there was a guy who was saying that if God really wanted the world to be evangelized, it would be evangelized. God doesn't really need us to do anything. And those things, I think, sound really spiritual to us. Yeah, you know, God really doesn't need us to do anything, so we just won't do anything. God will just do it all because he's so awesome. And there's, there's a hint of uh, us thinking, well, that's just, but, but we've got to think about that for a second. God has always wanted the world to be evangelized. From the first century until now. But after the first century brothers and sisters did it, nobody did it since. Is that because God's will changed? No, but that's because there hasn't been a group of people with the amount of faith to get God's will done. But when you have faith, God always blesses your perseverance. You know, we go on right here. And not only does Paul convert Sosthenes, but Priscilla and Aquila run into Apollos. Apollos gets met. He's taught the way of God more adequately. And he becomes one of the greatest preachers in the first century church. Then the Bible records Paul going to Ephesus and meeting the Ephesian 12. Probably Apollos' disciples that he had before he became a disciple. <laughs> if you can work that one out. But then they become true disciples through the truth of God. Well, chapter 19, verse 8. Let's see what kind of impact Paul has in Ephesus. 
Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that the, in the, all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Amen. Wow. Paul takes these 12 guys, these Ephesian disciples, and he goes and he starts having daily discussions or Bible talks at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So this was a campus ministry right here. And in two years' time, through having daily Bible talk discussions, he's able, able to spread the word all throughout the province of Asia so that everybody heard the word of the Lord. Now, you've got to realize right here, he's not saying that everybody became Christians. He's not even saying that everybody studied the Bible. But he is saying everybody heard the word of God. And that's what it means to evangelize a city or an area, is that everybody hears the word of God. Verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons who had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. I mean, you know you're a cranking guy when people take your snot rags and it heals people. <laughs> that's what was happening. I mean, they take Paul's handkerchiefs and they'll take it to the sick and the sick would be healed. I mean, isn't that cranking? Yeah. Let's read on. Verse 13. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, Jewish chief priests, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had an evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. You know, I... I I've seen some people get beat up in my day. But I've got to say, I've never seen somebody beat naked. And right here, these guys got beat pretty bad. But what was happening? Well, they were seeing what Paul was doing. They were seeing what the other apostles were doing. And they go, well, why don't we just copy that? But they didn't have any relationship with God personally. And so the demons go, hey, I know about Paul. I know about Jesus, but who are you? You see, guys, we can act like Christians, we can behave like Christians, but without a relationship with God, you're not going to be strong as a Christian. You with me, you guys? And those demons that come at you are going to overpower you. And you might find yourself beat naked. Amen, guys? Verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Right here, as they continued to preach, the message had such an impact that a lot of people who were in Ephesus right there brought their scrolls and the magic scrolls and burned. The Bible says there were 50,000 drachmas. That's how much they were worth. You go, well, how much is that? Well, a drachma is one day's wage. So this was 50,000 days' wages. And just for us to kind of relate to this right here, the average wage in San Diego is 21 bucks an hour. Now, whether you make that or not, th that's the average wage. <laughs> Amen, guys? If you were to calculate that out, $21 an hour per day for 50,000 days, that would come out to $42 million dollars. These people were so radical in their repentance that they literally brought $42 million worth of stuff and burned them right there because of the false doctrine and because of the occult that was happening right there in the city of Ephesus. You know, I think right here, we see that when people became disciples in the first century, there was a radical change. There was a radical transfer of heart. There was a radical decision that was made, and it led to a radical lifestyle after they became Christians. And wasn't it awesome just to see Marinella share right there? for a restoration. I mean, I, I think those of us who knew Marinella in the past, we can see a very radical change in Marinella. It's just awesome just to, for her to, to share her heart. It, it's kind of cool just getting together with Marinella and, and hearing her story, uh, because a lot of her story, I, I didn't really know that she had went through. And once I heard what she had gone through, I go, well, th that makes sense for why you kind of drifted the way you did. But now that she figured out where you're at, it's time to get back on track. And I, I'm proud of her because she took that upon herself. She goes, well, I, I've got to get back to God. And she worked very hard on her repentance. And it shows. It shows in a radical way. But we as disciples have got to be radical. 
We take our worldliness, we put it aside, and there's got to be a much different person on the next side. We pray to guys? Amen. Chapter 19, verse 21. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia to Caia. After I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Aristus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. You know, right here, I think we find at the very end of his second missionary journey, Paul deciding to go to Rome. He realized at this point that he has got to have an impact, not just in little cities, but over the course of the entire world. And in order for him to have that type of impact, he's got to have or, or go to the city that has the greatest, greatest impact at that time. And so at this point, he decides to get to Rome. Well, let's go to our last point right here. Make the most of today. Acts chapter 20, verse 1. When the upward had ended, Paul sent for his disciples, and after encouraging them, he said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Paris, from Berea, Astarchus from Secundus, from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went ahead and waited for us at Troas, but we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seating in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Hopefully that's not how you guys feel this morning. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. See, that's why you've got to make sure you stay awake in church. <laughs> Paul went down and threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. I bet that that's probably a great understatement right there. We find that Paul goes on at this point to Jerusalem. And then he tries to say goodbye to the Ephesian elders, those original 12 that had grown up at this point and become great stable pillars for the church. And so we pick it up in verse 31. He says, so be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. When Paul worked at a certain city, he was fully invested. He discipled the people in a group, but he also discipled people individually. And he goes, man, I, I warned you each night and day with tears. Verse 36. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was the statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. You know, I think in Paul's ministry, you can see the type of relationships he was able to forge and build. And right here, as he's leaving Ephesus, there, there was a tearing away that occurred within. And that tearing away was painful to him, but also to the other disciples. But it was a tearing away that, one, shows how much he invested into the church, but, two, shows how important it is for us to send out our best people. Because if Paul can invest himself in this church, Paul would then invest himself in the next church, and then the next church. You know, I'm very excited to send off Gabby and Chris. I, I think in a very real way, they've been such a great part of our church here. And when they leave, you can be sure there's going to be a tearing away that happens. Because we love them. They, they've invested their hearts here in San Diego. And I think we, we've got to get a conviction that wherever we are as disciples, we put our hearts into it. And I've already talked to Gabby and I've talked to Chris that once they go to Santa Barbara, they're not to say San Diego ever again. Of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But they, they've got to fully invest themselves in Santa Barbara. And to fully invest yourself, you can't have any back doors. And they've both agreed, and they're fired up to get their hearts here until they leave, and then invest in Santa Barbara. But let's close out in chapter 21, verse 17. It says, when they arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. 
You know, right here, I think Paul goes back and he reports the good news to the brothers. And interestingly enough, in verse 20, it says, when they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. Why were they zealous? Because Paul was zealous. But we're starting to see the impact that Paul was able to have in his ministry. But more importantly than that, I think we find right here that only James and the elders are in Jerusalem. All the other apostles at this point have scattered throughout the world, just like Paul right here, to preach the word of God. And Paul right here, along with the other apostles, they start to get it. Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. You know, there's a quote that says, Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift, and that's why we call it the present. I think we need to get down as disciples that every day we have here on this earth is an opportunity to spread God's word. Because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. you got to make the most of today. You know, when I was a kid, one of the things I, I love to do every year is to go out and pick mangoes. And uh, there's only a certain places that where we grew up where, where they actually grew. And sometimes, you know, if the sun wasn't right or if it rained too much, the mangoes wouldn't grow. And so when mangoes popped out, we were fired up. But we didn't have any on our own trees. We had to go and kind of scatter around the neighborhood and find trees that were out there and just find out how we could pick some mangoes. <laughs> and when the mangoes popped out, we knew we had to go quick because if you don't go quick, they might not be there the next day because there's a lot of other people that had the same idea. <laughs> That's how I think we've got to view people's souls. When the harvest is ripe, and the Bible says the harvest is always ripe, you've got to go out. And you got to pick them off the ground because if you don't, they just might not be here tomorrow. You know, next week, I I'm really excited. We're going to be having our Easter service. And uh, I, I think if there's one day people will come to church, it's Easter. <laughs> Easter and Christmas. And I want to personally challenge us as a church. Make the most of today. Don't wait till tomorrow and then tomorrow and then tomorrow to go out and share your faith and get somebody to come to church. Go out and find a visitor for church today, and then tomorrow, that day, and then the next day after that, that day as well. But let's make the most of every opportunity, because number one, God's giving us an uplifting vision. Take the word up from that. We are to be side-by-side -side preaching. Take the word side right there. We're to be knocked down, but not knocked out. Take the word down right there, and to make the most of today. Take the word today. What's the challenge? Just like the first century disciples did, we've got to turn the world upside down today. Thank you guys. God bless you all.